This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 84. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. Before we get started, let's talk about our great sponsors. 1791 Gun Leather is the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, and they'd like you to know their appreciation for the Second Amendment fuels their passion for gun leather and its representation of the original patriots of this great nation. 100% certified American steer hide joins four generations of professional leather artisans, creating the perfect firearms holsters. Carry your firearm with pride, knowing that each 1791 gun leather holster is handcrafted to be the best holster for your firearm. See their full product lineup at 1791gunleather.com. The supporting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast is Hodgden Powder. Available in granular powder and pellets, Hodgden's family of 777 powders gives muzzle-loading enthusiasts a quick-cleaning, low-odor, black powder substitute for rifle and pistol applications. To learn more, visit Hodgden.com. Today, we're talking with Jade Mulday, the editor of Shooting Industry Magazine. He recently attended the National Shooting Sports Foundation's Congressional Fly-In, where he spoke to several U.S. representatives and congresspeople about concerns facing the gun industry. In part two of our talk, we tackle the current ammo shortage and the accompanying price spikes, since Jade recently commissioned a major article for Shooting Industry on the topic. Now here's my talk with Jade Mulday. Good morning. Good morning, Brent. Thanks for having me on today. Well, Jade, I was really excited to have you on. We had a, a meeting earlier today, and you mentioned that you recently attended the National Shooting Sports Foundation Congressional Fly-In, and that means folks from our industry get to talk directly to our lawmakers in Washington, D.C., and I'm sure uh, you heard some interesting stuff, and uh, maybe some folks gave them an earful, too. Yeah, no, it's a very unique experience. Uh, this is the first time it was virtual just with the uh, you know, COVID protocols, and then with the Capitol probably looking sadly more like a military base these days <laughs> with all the perimeters around it. But um, I know, you know, I think their National Guard is going to be leaving, so hopefully it'll be a little bit more open moving forward, but <laughs> yeah, very different. Well, what is the general purpose of this thing? I know it's been going on for a number of years, and you've participated in it. Um, and to me, that's a cool thing that, you know, we can actually one-on-one time with, with our uh, national representatives. But what's what's the general purpose of this whole event? Yeah, the general purpose of the event is, uh, so this was the 13th uh, fly-in. Last year didn't happen, obviously, with thanks to the pandemic, but um, previous 12 years had been consecutive and uh, just an opportunity for the industry to be able to talk directly with lawmakers is, is as straightforward as that sounds. It's actually a really unique opportunity, a lot of logistical efforts, but uh, there's generally, like, you know, this year there are five teams could be up to seven teams that or so that that attend but it gives us a chance uh, as the industry is uh, presidents of companies dealers who own their own retail stores wholesale distributors providing their perspective all all corners of the industry um, their main leadership are able to attend the event and tell uh, elected officials uh, how potential legislation impacts their businesses firsthand and just providing additional context and you know hearing from directly from the source rather than, than secondhand from a lobbyist. So it's a kind of refreshing take for them. Well, there's two sides to that equation, the elected officials and the industry. What would you say, uh, if you can draw a, using a very broad brush, uh, what's kind of the, the feeling or the consensus from the industry side of things, speaking now politically? Uh, I would say, um, I mean, there are some legitimate concerns the industry has with some of the legislation. I know with a, you know, Democrat-controlled Congress uh, on the House side, it's the the majority is shrinking for them, and maybe it can be turned around in 2022. And on the Senate side, it's an even Senate makes things difficult. And I know one of the things that were of kind of a, a priority during the uh, the fly-in was the uh, nomination of David Shipman, and that's a Senate-confirmed position. And so it's a you know 50-50 Senate right now. And if it, people were to vote down party lines, they'd be then broken by our our favorite Vice President, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Ms. Harris. But um, 
so that the, so there is like really concern there from the industry and uh, trying to you know talk with lawmakers how different things would be impacting them. Uh, so that but overall, I, I think it's a uh, I you know, hadn't been involved in flying previously to I've been doing the last five years of this flying, but compared to other groups, I'm not sure how they're run. But ours it's, it's very structured and very cordial. Um, you know, everyone's you know really respectful of, of each other and just you know talking to the representative. It's um, you know, a very neat event in that sense. Well, I was going to we were going to talk about the Chipman nomination later on, but hey, you brought it up. Let's let's tackle it right now. This guy is a flaming wrong number as a potential director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. Is that pretty much the did the industry lay it on the line to our representatives about that? Yeah, they did. And they were, you know, like as I noted previously, you know, cordial and respectful about it, but yeah, absolutely, the the industry is vehemently opposed to his nomination. And one of the powerful uh, parts of our conversation with the elected officials, the congressmen and senators uh, during the flying, was this is actually the first time the industry, uh, by and large, NSSF included, is opposing a, a nominee, which actually. Yeah, oddly enough, uh, the only so this became a confirmed position by the Senate in 2006. Since 2006, there's only been one confirmed uh, full-time director of the ATF, and that was uh, President Obama's nominee, uh, B. Todd Jones, and he was confirmed in 2013. Previously to that, and and since then, every director has been serving in an acting capacity. Uh-huh. So uh, it says something that we were you know, able to show us with the congressmen and, and women during the fly-in that the, the industry actually supported Obama's. Uh, nominee and but David Chipman just with his background and his rhetoric uh, in the beginning of the pandemic we're telling people to you know, keep their guns behind their their cans of tuna beef jerky <laughs> <laughs> during yeah. during the during the gun buying uh, peak uh, you know says a lot so well then how was the message received on the other end so by and large and I'm, I must clarify I I misspoke just previously we didn't speak to representatives we talked about it uh, you know more informally with uh, with the those in Congress on the House side, just because they're not involved in this process, but on the Senate side, uh, they they did hear our our message, and it did you know they they uh, it definitely caught their attention, so to speak, when we had said that this was the first time the industry is opposing a, yeah. a nominee for ATF, and uh, you know we actually were able to speak with uh, Senator Cotton's not himself, he was actually during it was literally in the hearing when we spoke with his staff, but they. Uh, he had a, um, a viral exchange with with the uh, with the nominee about defining what an assault weapon was, and uh, you know made it broadened the the brush so to speak on what an assault weapon is in, in his view. And he is very much in favor of outlawing them. But he was obviously quick to say in the hearing that he would only follow the law. But at the head of the ATF, you know, making those laws and kind of putting that burden on Congress. But he also has his own agenda throughout uh, the process as well. Well, and I think that's what's got everybody concerned. He's been very partisan, and he absolutely has an agenda that he has pushed. And uh, that's pretty scary when uh, you have the guy at, at the head of an agency that is so significant to what we do and, and to our industry um, that he is. Uh, there's no question in anybody's mind on any side of this issue. Uh, David Chipman is anti-gun. That's that's the end. The end all be all. Yeah, and it speaks volumes that he, he previously was a lobbyist for Every Town for Gun Safety and currently employed for Giffords, which, quick side note, uh, Senator uh, Kelly from Arizona has co-founded it with his wife. And so he would be voting on this. So conflict of interest, perhaps there. Yeah, you think. Um, <laughs> um, wow. But it is a concern for the industry that, uh, I mean, as contrary to what people might think, the industry at you know at large is has a very... A complimentary relationship with ATF. Um, actually, we are the NSSF has advocated for additional funding for ATF to do its job and enforce laws. And um, we, you know, we've, we've seen it firsthand, just in, even in conversations um, with the congressman during the fly-in. Uh, one of the manufacturers there said they've had ATF agents at their at their facility to help them. With, with, um, you know, sometimes firearms that are used in crimes have the serial numbers scrubbed out and giving them, you know, some solutions to help be able to decide or you know, actually know what those were and to give additional information. So they've invited them into their, their facilities and have helped them. And NSSF has partnered with, with ATF and worked with ATF for its Project Child Safe initiative. And they've provided 40 million gun locks across the country. Um, and they've worked with law enforcement agencies to help disseminate those. And 
Uh, and another initiative that NSSF has partnered with the ATF is their Operation Secure Store. It's a joint effort that they've developed uh, to help FFLs uh, make good decisions uh, with regard to who's buying firearms to. Yeah. So I guess the big overarching question here is, what was your takeaway from the fly-in? I mean, uh, obviously, we always worry that uh, elected officials tell us exactly what we want to hear, and then they go do whatever they're going to do. But what was your your kind of feeling uh, coming off of this? Yeah, uh, from from my perspective, I would I would rate it a success in the sense it gave the industry an opportunity to talk directly with the elected officials, and uh, they you know they they uh, some of them weren't as you know vocal in their support, but there were others that were like, wanting to co-sign and talk to their staff about joining ad- additional bills that are that are currently uh, in Congress or introduced, or some that might be coming very soon. Uh, I know. Uh, on the financial side, there's been some, uh, up some, <laughs> a lot of, of discrimination, and um, heard firsthand from examples from manufacturers that have been either, you know, been threatened by their bank that they need to find a new bank if they don't stop making a particular product, to trying to lease a vehicle. Or yeah, let me interrupt you there. Tell the story you told us in our meeting today um, about a major gun manufacturer that that basically, with all their money, they were told, you're not welcome at our bank. Yeah, I was um, made aware during the fly-in, heard from directly from a major manufacturer with decades of, uh, of, of existence in the industry. And they, they've they been partnered with Bank of America for, uh, they said, decades and got a call in 2018 that unless you exit the AR market, we will no longer be your bank. And so their response is, well... We're going to find a new bank and uh, transitioned rather quickly to uh, to Wells Fargo to to move the, the ball along and continue paying their employees and paying their you know suppliers and making sure they're continuing to operate. And they said it was a challenge, but they were able to do it. Uh, another manufacturer on the on the smaller scale uh, told an example there they were denied service to lease a forklift, and they said they could pay for that in their words a hundred times over. But they're trying to be smart financially and wanted to lease a forklift and got denied based on the nature of their business. And so it is it is a very real concern, a really real thing. And uh, others, uh, dealers, have, uh, FFL retailers have talked about getting rejected on insurance or even with other uh, uh, financial sources over time just because of the nature of our business. So it's very much we're a highly regulated industry one of the few industries that's actually guaranteed in the constitution, the second amendment (laughs) and very much facing the financial discrimination. So, um, you know, that some of that did hit home with the, um, with the members. So that'll be a positive moving forward, hopefully. Well, and at the same time, there was a push to, uh, make sure that, that things like, uh, marijuana and things like that have access to the banking system. So that's okay. But, something protected by the constitution is not you know you just shake your head and i hope the uh, representatives can see see the the logic or illogic of of those kind of uh, ideas yeah i would i would hope so <laughs> they they seem to be especially like one of the powerful parts of the flying is the first hand examples so that's where they could hear directly from manufacturers how they're being impacted so in this case it it definitely made it more powerful um so so do you come away from this a little more hopeful that maybe things aren't as, as uh, doom and gloom as many of us feel it is, given the current administration and, and state of uh, Washington in general? Um, or do you think that uh, we're in for a long road here? I feel a mixture of both. I do think there are positives to take away. I also can see the argument that there is a long road ahead of us, but I'm thankful for checks and balances in our system where there's something like the uh, – Director of BATF is now a Senate confirmed position rather than being appointed directly by the president. So those types of measures do help where it's not unilaterally being decided what's going to be happening. And um, I know even just with recent, you know, with other negotiations politically that there's some fracturing occurring in the Democratic Party with trying to get policies pushed. And so perhaps that'll help our efforts in the future. But, um, yeah, overall, I, I Probably a mixture of both, I would say. (laughs) Yeah. And this is kind of an opinion question, but, you know, we're constantly telling gun owners you need to make your voice heard, both by joining organizations and by just contacting your elected representatives. Your feeling in working one-on-one with them and their staffs during these type of events, 
do you think they really do listen to us? Do you think it's really important to call your congressman's office or do you think you just get lip service? I think it's absolutely vital to be politically engaged. And, you know, if, if you live in a district or a state where, I mean, in, I mean, we're in California. I mean, I mean, live in California, so I won't be <laughs> contacting my senators. <laughs> about <laughs> Yeah, rights, I was going to say but, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you're in a state where perhaps it is a, a swing vote, possibly, I think it's absolutely worthwhile. And um, the line that, you know, we've I've been hearing said is it, it's true where people are, are voting with their wallets. And this past year, you know, up, up to about eight and a half million people purchased firearm for the first time. And w- despite the fact that there's all these anti-gun efforts taking place, people are are freely going forward and wanting to purchase firearms. And so they're speaking with their wallets. And I think taking a step further, getting politically activated and contacting your representative uh, in your district or, or your senator, uh, I think it's it's vital for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and you, you've made a perfect segue there. We're going to talk about the, the second topic, and this is one that is that is a hot and juicy topic. But when you're talking about voting with your wallet, obviously that leads into the discussion of the ammo shortage and the ammo prices. And you are, you are the guy that uh, we all go to on this topic because you are the editor of Shooting Industry, our, one of our uh, sister publications, and you talk to dealers and manufacturers every single day, and you recently did uh, a big story on that. You talked to a lot of folks, and we recently had you on uh, the Gun Cranks, our video series, and I thought we ought to, we ought to discuss that because I don't care how much uh, evidence we lay out or, or testimony from folks who know, we still continue to get these letters of people saying that it's a vast conspiracy and uh, either the government's holding out or the manufacturers are in cahoots with the Trilateral Commission or whatever it is. But as an overview, as a guy who really does talk to all sides of the equation, what is the ammo situation right now? It has been just absolute mayhem. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, the the long and the short of it is, I mean, the, over this past year, I mean, everyone, you know, we've all gone through an unprecedented period with just, you know, so many different factors coming into it. Um, I know uh, Roy Huntington has, has wrote in American Handgunner, and you guys have talked about it in Gun Cranks previously, but there is a lot that goes into making ammunition, especially to the scale that's needed. And I spoke with uh, four domestic producers, actually three domestic producers of ammunition, uh, an importer, and then one that um, it represents European brands here in the U.S. But um, I mean, each of the folks I talked to said that they're producing more than they ever have before. And not only that, but they're shipping more than they ever have before. And it still isn't enough, which just speaks volumes to how much interest there is right now in firearms ownership. And, and uh, initially, the people were concerned with the, you know, I, I um, jokingly wrote, I think, in my column in shooting industry that it's, you know, the great toilet paper crisis <laughs> in, in ammunition form where people are perhaps not needing as much that, that they are, um, they're looking to buy, but they're buying it just because they see it on the shelf. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, you know, it just, it says a lot. And, and no one knew this was going to be happening when people were making their orders in the run up to last year for supplies and you know, machinery and things like that. I mean, I think even if they were to predict that it, this was going to happen, it still would have been a formidable challenge just with all the factors that go into this. You're talking to dealers, and what are they saying? I mean, I'm, I'm sure I, we all know we're all adults here, and it's free market. Some of them are raising prices. But what is their take on it from their side of the coin? Uh, so the dealers are in a difficult position. And uh, yes, there are dealers that have said that, especially with the first time buyers, they, you know, can willingly raise prices and that's, that's to their, their decision. Um, but then there are also those dealers that have said that they are not going to be doing price gouging and they want to develop long-term relationships with these customers and, you know, try to, to not have them be a one and done type of customer. And, but it has been prices have risen across the supply chain that the manufacturers I spoke to, did say this uh, input costs have increased the uh, price of copper, which is used in brass, um, you know, casings and that cost has gone up. The lead market has also been impacted, uh, not only with ammo market uh, makes up 10% of the lead market and 
uh, lead prices have increased due to increased um, demand in that in that category with uh, people out last year buying RVs and boats that need batteries. I mean, that's been drawing up the, the lead prices and even things like paper uh, have gone up, which is used in packaging for ammunition. So um, all of those factors have, have contributed to rising costs. And some of the manufacturers said they've absorbed uh, a portion of those costs, but it has been passed along the line. And uh, it's, you know, they're, Controlling prices, uh, you know, at least from the manufacturing side with with map pricing, minimum advertised price. I mean, that's just very difficult to enforce. And for something volatile like ammo is being moved very quickly. Um, so it's all those factors are in place. Um, and yeah, I guess a, a long answer to a short question is there are there are people that are rising prices and that's to their, you know, uh, their prerogative, I suppose. But then there are that are trying to keep it at cost as much as possible and hoping to develop long-term relationships. So as you said before, vote with your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And before, because we've gotten the criticism, well, you're just shilling for the, the dealers. Not. No, it, it, if they raise their prices and you don't think that's right, then go elsewhere. Otherwise, my suggestion is just quit buying ammo so so much so fast. And I, I know I've got a lot of friends that, well, I just bought another 500 rounds. And I'm like, why? Well, you know, it, it was available. and I don't know what's going to happen. Well, you know, if you've only got one or two boxes, okay, maybe you need some more ammo. But I know people that have entire garages full of ammunition. They've got far more ammunition than I've got. I'm not sure that extra 100 or 200 rounds they they gobble up the second they see it, at, you know, put on the shelf at the store is really going to make that big a difference. But they continue to do it because everybody else is. Yeah, and I know it, like, even with primers, too, that's a concern for reloaders and it's just it's everything is just being impacted and so you know that's one of those cases where there's this literally hundreds of millions of rounds that were not accounted for last year with all these new buyers so <laughs> i think if we all just kind of settle down a little bit and give ammo manufacturers the chance to catch up uh, that would that would help <laughs> yep and and i know prices are coming down in some instances and there's better availability remington is now back online i know somebody that just got 250,000 rounds from them which is a drop in the bucket but it's it's a lot more than they had been shipping because they were on hiatus for a year uh while remington went through its troubles so uh big green is back throwing ammo out from their plant yeah that was great to see that i, I think that's definitely going to help and in the interview also with some of the manufacturers did highlight the absence of remington ammunition as a factor in in the shortage obviously there are many factors but now with them back online again that's absolutely going to help things yeah because that's a huge plant and <laughs> they put out a lot of ammunition so <laughs> having a major player back online is a good thing well you know in closing i i just was sitting here thinking and this is a question that we have not discussed you know, one thing that everybody's uh, upset about gun shortages and certainly we've got political headwinds and just disorder and things are just really squirrely now. But, you know, I would be interested to get your take on the fact that the firearms industry is so flush with cash right now. Um, I can't uh, think of a time when other than maybe not even like when the assault weapon ban came in under Clinton, everybody went crazy and bought but uh, guns and receivers, but now it's everything, ammunition, any kind of gun, any type of gun, used guns, new guns. The industry is is flush right now. Do you think that's going to uh, maybe create a lot more opportunities, or you think people are just going to salt it away for a rainy day, or what do you think this uh, is the long-term impact of of doing so much business so fast over the last year and a half? I think that's a great question, and I, I absolutely think there's going to be new opportunities that come as a result of this with, um, I mean, really industry-wide across the board. I mean, I, I really honestly can't think of a category. I mean, maybe I'm misspeaking, but I don't think there's really a category that's struggling at, at the moment. Obviously, we're procuring product, but people are selling just incredibly incredible amounts of, of their products. And I think even just with um, you know some of the, uh, the taxes that are involved with Pittman Robertson, I know some of the readers and listeners may, you know, may not be familiar with it, but when you buy a box of ammo and firearm, that goes toward the Pittman-Robertson Fund, which goes for conservation efforts. And so I, those numbers are increasing, which is fantastic, and you know, creating more ranges and opportunities for people to enjoy the outdoors. So I, I do think that is going to be the case where there's going to be more opportunities. And we interviewed some dealers also, and they you know, 
kind of saving it for a rainy day, some of the funds that they have, but others are looking to reinvest into their storefronts, reinvest into upgrading different parts of their facilities and uh, making the shooter experience um, more of a, a just positive, fun experience. So I think that's one of the things that the industry should continue striving to do is highlighting the fun side of the, of the shooting sports. Well, we try to highlight it. Believe it or not, the good old days are right now. Yeah, and actually I was even um, you know, reviewing the 2010 decade because one of the reports we're working on, we examined the uh, product, firearms production data and just evaluating the firearms, uh, specifically it's focusing on nine millimeter handguns, but the number of lines that were introduced in the 2010s, you have the shield, SIG P320, <laughs> SIG P365, the Hellcat at the end of the decade. I mean, that's incredible, just the amount of the innovation that's gone into the industry. And the, just those lines are just incredibly popular and <laughs> yeah. just a joy to shoot. Yep. Well, Jade, it's been great talking to you about the state of the business. I think we would be remiss. I already mentioned you are the editor of Shooting Industry, one of our sister publications, and it is geared towards uh, folks that work in the industry, FFL holders, gun dealers, manufacturers. But uh, whether you're an industry insider or you're just a interested shooter that likes to know a little bit, bit more about the industry, how can they learn more about shooting industry? Yeah, you can go to shootingindustry.com. And on our website, we have um, links to current news, uh, obviously links to stories that we have in the magazine. And it uh, comes out monthly to, to storefront dealers and it goes out to across the country to about 20,000 of them. And uh, it's a publication that just covers the ins and the outs of the industry. So, you know, for those of you that might be interested into more that goes into the industry and how dealers operate and the thought process that they have and just really even putting yourself in their shoes at the risk that they have involved with what they do and uh, just if you want more information it's we have a lot out there uh, for the industry well jade thanks for talking to us on the guns magazine podcast thanks brent It was really interesting talking to Jade because he's an expert on the business of guns and you can take his words to the bank. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Guns Magazine was first in the business and we're bringing you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got a question or comments about the show, please email me. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast catcher, YouTube, and of course at gunsmagazine.com. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com and AmericanCop.com. We'd also appreciate it if you'd share a favorite episode or some kind words on your own social media. And finally, don't forget to check out the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, 1791 Gun Leather. Learn more at 1791GunLeather.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast for the entire staff at FMG Publications. I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. <laughs>